And so my next guest is well used to the demands of hitting the Irish political campaign trail in his relatively short career. He's already been a poll topper in his local council elections and more recently a senator in Leinster House. His achievements are all the more remarkable given the fact that he's nearly blind. And he's here tonight to share his story. Would you welcome please Senator Martin Conway, ladies and gentlemen. Good to have you on the programme. Thanks, man. And thanks for coming in. You know, even coming on tonight, we, being honest and practical about it, we talked about earlier on walking in like that as somebody who has very minimal uh, sight. What are you working off? Working off 16% on average, um, Ryan. And <clears throat> coming on tonight, thankfully I had a dry run earlier on. So yeah. I uh, developed my sixth sense uh, earlier on. So I was rather comfortable really coming on. Yeah. But, um, but just it, was, it was important for you, was it not, to... To, to do that walk into Absolutely. the program rather than, you know, be, be, to be found sitting down on the program. Absolutely. Walk the walk like everyone else. Yeah. So, um, you know, it was. And, like, I suppose that's, that's my, my whole being in politics and all of that is to sort of be the same and sure. uh, do the same as everyone else. Sixteen uh, percent. What, what, can you give me a sort of an, an idea of what that might be? Well, it's impossible. I'd love to have a pair of glasses to hand you to say, yeah. this is what I can see. Sure. As I'm looking at you tonight now, I know that you have um, a blue tie with um, white spots. Yeah. But don't ask me to tell you the colour of your eyes. I'm yeah. sorry, Ryan. Yeah. But I don't know myself, <laughs> but uh, there's a pair of us in it. But, <laughs> but, 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 but you can see, you can make that, even that level out is, is I suppose, something it, it, at the risk of Absolutely. being glib about it. Absolutely. I mean, and look, it depends on circumstances. Um, it, it, obviously, the light helps. Um, uh, daytime is better than nighttime. Yeah. Uh, if the light's good as it is here in the studio, it's better than if the light isn't good. Okay. It depends on whether you're tired or not. Or if I was out for a few pints last night, for example, I mightn't be as good in the following morning. You know. So if you've got a hangover, you're looking at about eight uh, percent. Possibly even less. <laughs> it depends <laughs> on how good the night was. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> okay. Um, it's 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 an inherited condition. Is that right? Absolutely. I okay. inherited it from my father who in turn inherited it from his father right and I have one brother who doesn't have the condition he has almost got 20 20 eyesight uh, whereas I inherited it and uh, isn't that extraordinary the lottery absolutely of life. Yeah. I would say 50 50 so like um, Brian uh, uh, is fortunate that he doesn't have it and I have yeah. it and um, if um, I have kids uh, going forward well there's always a risk that uh, it'll pass on so that must be a conversation you probably have to have then with your wife about, or, or, do, or will you just go for it and see what happens? Play it by ear. Will you? Yeah. <laughs> Good answer. Um, tell me a little bit about the, 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 the I suppose, the realisation as a child that you weren't like all the other kids, to, to use the cliche. When, when did it become apparent to you that this was the case? Well, the penny uh, dropped one day. Obviously, I had a lot of visits to Dublin to see consultants and um, eye specialists and so forth, and I would travel quite regularly with my father by train. And uh, as children do, I had a fascination uh, uh, with the train. And I just said uh, to my father, I said, God, Dad, I'd love to be a train driver someday. Yeah. And there was silence. And then he said, I I'm afraid that's not going to happen, Martin, because unfortunately your eyesight will never be good enough uh, to be in a position to drive anything. How old were you? Four. Ah, uh, yeah. That's a tough thing for a dad to have to tell his son, let alone for a son to hear from his dad. Absolutely. But, you know, uh, I suppose my father felt that the time had come that uh, I should realise that there was an issue there and that, uh, you know, it wasn't going to be the same uh, as everybody else. Can you recall, I know it's a very young age, but can mm. you, re you clearly you can recall the moment, but can you recall how you felt about that? Puzzled. Yeah. would be the best description yeah, yeah, yeah. because um, uh, and then I suppose uh, as time went on and I attended school mm -hmm. um, I realized that I had these uh, desperate small jam jar type glasses with <laughs> an elastic band on and of course children being children I had the notion of holding them or, or leaving them on my head so yeah. I just cut them and flung them so there was, there was no uh, glasses going on my face uh, for a long time, uh, uh, but um, eventually, uh, obviously, it, it had to, and um, the whole uh, myriad of low vision aids uh, were made available to try and ensure that... Such uh, as? Such as 
I remember at one stage there was a little telescope uh, that I used to uh, read the blackboard with. But of course, I rebelled against that as well. Yes. And the telescope lasted, I'd say, about a week. It was goddamn awful. And I just wasn't <laughs> prepared to, uh, to, to be horrendous, actually. So um, I, I rebelled against that. But you yeah. know, some low vision aids worked, others didn't. Sure. And, um, you know, I, I kind of uh, I, I, I fell, I, I established my own happy medium with that type of thing. Um, I suppose integrated education um, yeah. was very important for me. Because you, you went to a mainstream school, didn't you? You could have gone to a school for the blind, I suspect. And, and whose decision was that, and were you happy with it? Yeah, my parents and my father, in particular, who had uh, gone to integrated education himself, yes. was determined whatever the, the, the drawbacks are, that I was going to grow up in an assignment at home with my family, mm -hmm. and I was going to go to school in an assignment with all the local kids. And Difficult and all as it may be, uh, it uh, was felt by um, my family that it was the right decision, mm. and I absolutely, and this was pre-SNA, uh, when, yeah. were, when there weren't SNAs, and um, when you were relying on your teacher to be uh, an SNA, along with being a, a teacher to 20 or 30 other kids. Sure. So, I mean, it was, it, it was challenging, there's no doubt about it. Did uh, you get grief from, well, the, from the other kids? Absolutely. I think anybody uh, uh, who wears glasses uh, uh, will remember the, 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 the name calling. But to be fair, it didn't get out of hand because obviously I was identified as a target and uh, it was, I was monitored very closely. So it didn't get out of hand. But there's no point in saying it didn't exist. It did. Yeah. Uh, but I would be of the firm belief that it's what's molded me as a person now. And that, okay. um, you know, it certainly did equip me with a set of skills that uh, um, I, I think have helped me going forward in life. And things like sports days and, and, and all, that, all those sort of events, how did you figure in, in those occasions? Well, you know, I've put myself into the captain of any team. You're certainly not going to pick the guy who can't see the ball. No, no. <laughs> So, I mean, that, that, that is a very prosaic answer um, and, and one that uh, probably left you pretty much standing on your own when they were calling the other boys out of the team. Absolutely. But yeah. You're, uh, yeah, if you're the boy who has not been picked, I suppose it, it, it doesn't augur too yeah. well for your confidence, but just get well, over I, it. I'll tell you something, Martin. I, I, I've got very good eyesight and, and I didn't get picked either. That was the last man standing for, different, <laughs> for, for, for very different reasons. Yeah. Um, so, we can exchange stories of coping mechanisms, but let me hear about yours first. Uh, how did you cope and, and what did you do to, to protect yourself from any unpleasantness in, in your life? I was feisty and um, loud-mouthed. All right, okay, well. And I was well able to stand up for myself yeah. and um, I gave as good as I got. Did you? I did, I did, I did. And um, I'd say any of my school colleagues now, or my school friends at the time, w would tell you that I was well able to fight my corner. Yes. And um, I suppose I had the confidence, uh, and I was lucky that I had the confidence uh, to be able to fight my corner. Yes. So thankfully I'm still fighting my corner. Good. And on you go. And you, would, you decided to go to University College Dublin. I did. Uh, and you went there to... Did you, did you go there for a reason? Was it because it was the only one that you got offered or because you wanted to well, go I had to there? Be, or? No, I had to be practical because, like, obviously I had an issue. Um, uh, uh, reading was a difficulty. Of and course. I felt that uh, what I did was I went around and I did as much research as possible mm. uh, in terms of, you know, where would have the best set of supports. And UCD was in Dublin. It was the biggest. And um, in fairness, they did have a very good access program, even back in the mid-90s. So, um, you know, I benefited from that. And, you know, I developed other interests, particularly interests in, in politics and societies and uh, rights and, uh, and so forth. So, you know, my, um, uh, uh, my decision to pick UCD was a planned one. Uh, it was done uh, over a period of time, and I think it was the right one. Right one to do. And it was the right one in many ways, because you met a girl, as she was at the time, called Breege. After how many weeks were you there? A week. A week. The first week, we were queuing up to vote in a students' union election yes and um, I met this uh, a, a, a girl who turned out to be I suppose um, my guardian angel if you like going through college um, she was uh, along with being uh, uh, there as a friend she was uh, kept an eye on me and yeah. um, of course you know it, it took 11 years for me to see the light and actually ask her out and that had nothing to do with the bad eyes <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so you befriended uh, Breach after a week, so yeah. you, you, were, you didn't waste time then, but you yeah. did waste an enormous amount of time, maybe a decade or more, uh, kind of dancing around the issue before you got your act together to, uh, what, ask her out? Ask her out, yeah. Well done, and, um, th Thankfully she said yes, because it would have been a damn long wait. Yeah, oh, yeah so she's going to wonder what's going on. Uh, Breach, you probably thought he'd never ask, uh, but, uh, but nevertheless, uh, he, he, finally, he finally got his act together. Do you remember meeting him in that first week? 
Actually, I do. Uh, I think I might be enjoying up to either to vote in a student union bar election or something yeah, of some something, great importance. Something critical like that, yeah. Yeah. And actually, um, Martin asked me what societies had I joined. And of course, I said um, everything like from the history society to geography to so societies. The last one I mentioned was Young Fine Gael. And it turned out that Martin actually also uh, had joined Young Fine Gael. So that was the start of obviously a perfect relationship uh, that we both agreed on the same si side of the house. Uh, but I remember clearly, all right, and obviously Obviously, I had noted that Martin in our uh, class sat at the very front. He, it was quite obvious in the first couple of days of lectures that he was there at the front, and there was obviously a difference. And obviously, a, a curiosity about that as well. Yeah. Uh, but here we are, telling the tale. Yeah, I said that's some co coalition. Uh, <laughs> the funny thing is, Ryan, she, I, I consider her as the loyal opposition. She's my fiercest critic, but she's my, yet my most loyal supporter. Well, that's, so. cri that's critical uh, for, for you both, because you ended up running for, for office. You were in Clare County Council 2004. Again, in 2009 where you topped the poll and then you ran for the, Sh the Shannad, um, was, which was of course a national campaign having run, done the local situation. Um, was, that, uh, was it difficult for you or, or, or do you just get by? Has technology moved on to let you do it with considerable ease? Well, it's never considerable ease because obviously I can't drive. Um, I represent a rural constituency. Right. Um, like everyone will know the legends in politics who can remember thousands of faces and link up the thousands of names. I, I can do very. I, I would do very well to recognise the names of the people I love. So, as such, uh, you know, the whole uh, notion of clamouring people and pretending you know them and maybe remembering <laughs> the names goes out the window. Yeah. So, I effectively, um, you know, not being able to drive, I rely on a lot of people to support me okay. and to, to, to help me out in that regard. Mm -hmm. So, like, uh, it's not easy, but then life isn't easy. And if it was, everybody would be doing it. So, yeah. you know, it's, it's a great privilege to be a member of the Oireachtas. And um, I suppose I, I come uh, with. Uh, 16% vision and the first uh, uh, person in that circumstances to be in the Oireachtas and I do consider it a privilege and thankfully you know technology has moved on since I was in school and like the iPad is there now and I find that yeah. tremendously helpful in terms of reading legislation and so on. Yes. So, and, and when you got there that first day, were you were you okay to get around, or did you did you spend a bit of time walking like you did tonight? You came out a bit yeah. earlier on just to walk the land, as they say. I think I got elected on a Friday, and the following Monday or Tuesday, I came to Dublin and I came into Leinster House and I spent the whole day just walking around, getting yeah. to know what, getting to know where there were steps, uh, getting to know the corridors where the lifts were, okay. uh, the toilets are practical stuff. And um, I felt that then, when the first sitting day came, two or three weeks later, yeah. I was in a far better position then uh, uh, to be able to navigate myself around Leinster House with a little bit of ease. And when you're there, you know, when you take this week, we, Joanna Reardon, you know, a great friend of the mm. programmes, and somebody I had great time and admiration for was talking about the issue of mobility grant cuts, of course, mm. and then you, you of course, with this, this scenario that you, you have personally, must feel quite strongly about a decision like that. Do you, do you find it hard to agree with your own government? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm not there as a shrinking violet. I'm there to articulate mm. and to argue. And so to would fight you be against it. that then, for example, um, well, that cut? Um, what I am against is the waste of money that has happened in the disability sector. Uh, I have been assured uh, by uh, Minister Riley and Minister Lynch that this is going to be sorted out. Yeah. And it's my job to keep after them every week to ensure that it is and that a, uh, a scheme that's fair and equitable is introduced uh, yeah. as a matter of urgency. And I intend to do that. I've been doing it already in the last uh, few days and I intend to continue so you'll be jumping it. up and down with them about this well, sort of proposal. I've been on the phone to them. I've spoken to uh, 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 Minister Riley two or three times this week yeah. already and I spoke to Minister Lynch on the corridor last week. I, okay. I binned it her ear at one stage. So, you know, um, yeah, that's worth the effort. That's I suppose if you want to spend a lot of time with them, just get in the lift. Um, what about the, the, uh, the, the idea of, uh, the, of, of manoeuvring yourself around the Leinster House and, and the Shannon Aaron and that kind of thing? And mm. normally, the glad handling, as you were talking about the plumossing, to use yeah. your word, uh, involves you having to say, how are you doing, and how are you, Mar how are you Martin, and how are you mm. Mary, and all the rest of it. Um, you have to, because of your situation, you're kind of de-spoofed in, in some respects, but do you, do you find yourself having trouble picking somebody out in the, in the, in the corridor as you're walking along then? Absolutely. It was a funny one, this one, I don't know whether I should say it or not, but I remember one day I needed to speak to Phil Hogan, yeah. Minister for the Environment, fairly urgently uh, about a matter, and uh, I spent a good bit of the day looking for him, so I spotted him uh, going down the corridor, and as people might know, Leinster House, the corridor, it's an old building, so the corridors are quite dark. So I, there was a lot of people in the 
the same corridor. So I proceeded down the corridor to have my quiet word in the minister's ear. Uh, and as I approached, I was uh, a little bit taken aback to discover that it wasn't actually Phil Hogan, but it was a, a very tall pot plant. <laughs> Seriously? Fact. <laughs> Did you start talking to the plant? Uh, no, uh, um, I was just Did about you get any answers out of the plant? I, I, I was just about <laughs> to say, can I have a word, Phil? And I realised, good God, this is... <laughs> <laughs> oh dear, oh dear. Yeah. Well, I presume you want to move uh, buildings at some stage and become a TD. Is that the plan? Absolutely. I suppose my ultimate aim, if you ask me what my ideal job is, yeah. I'd like to be Minister for Education because yeah. Minister for Education can really affect change in terms of getting... Education is the one way I really believe yeah. that lives can be changed. But in order to do that, obviously, I do have to become a TD. And a lot of people have been very good to me uh, in ter over, my, over the last number of years, sure. getting me to where I am. And I'd like to thank them. But I'd like to thank in advance the many, many more people who are going to help me to get elected to There you there. go. Yeah. Well, that's, no, you've just sat down your manifesto there. <laughs> Martin, thanks for coming to see us tonight. My pleasure. Martin, Martin Connor, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks, Martin. Okay. <laughs> the campaign begins here.